Shyamalan. Okay, I don't even hate M. Night Shyamalan. Has he created some absolute trash? Yes. Has he also created some hilarity? Absolutely. Has he created some stuff that I've genuinely enjoyed and felt captivated by? Yes. So I'm not a Shyamalan naysayer. I didn't even dislike Glass as much as everyone else did. I thought The Visit was one of the most uncomfortable and unsettling movies I've ever seen, and I actually like The Village. So when I saw the trailer for Old, I was horrified. First it looked goofy, then it was horrifying when this aged up toddler seemingly became spontaneously pregnant. My nightmare. Truly. Rated PG-13, fun for the whole family. And then you see M. Night's name and you're like, oh God, there's so many ways this could go. But sadly, it seems like he tried to do all of the things he does at once, but not to full capacity. So it just felt lackluster in a lot of ways. So this is actually loosely based on a graphic novel called Sandcastle by Pierre Oscar Levi and Frederick Peters. And the two stories do share a lot, but they're also vastly different. Especially when it comes to the execution and the fact that Shyamalan has to Shyamalan. <laughs> a lot of the themes are still there, but then he's got to do the thing he does and then like really explain everything. And I don't mind that, but I literally clocked a central piece of what was going on at the five minute mark of this movie. So we're going to start off with no spoilers, talk about what I liked, what I didn't like, how it kind of compares to the comic book a little bit. And then I'll be very clear when I swap into direct spoilers, because I know some people haven't had a chance to see this yet and maybe want to. So general premise, as made obvious by the trailer, the poster and the title is that a family heads to the beach end up with some other people at that same beach before realizing that they physically can't leave the beach and a series of increasingly horrible events start to take place. Like what appears to be a spontaneous pregnancy, but we'll get there. So this was simultaneously too awkward to be good, but then not awkward and off the walls enough to be super fun. To me at least, a lot of people are really liking it, but a lot of people are absolutely hating it. I will say that for people who are interested in or concerned by the potential for like the deeper body horror or just like graphic imagery, it does not commit to body horror at all, except for like one scene towards the end. So if you were hoping for a lot of that, it is not going to deliver. There's a reason why a bunch of people are like, oh my God, imagine like a Cronenberg version of this movie. <laughs> the graphic novel it's based on has been described as like a cruel fairy tale, but a lot of people see it as like a parable or a fable that specifically deals with mortality, life, humanity, and extinction. Whereas the movie is largely a thriller with the bones of that parable inside. But I think the big thing here is that I just really love the concept and the premise and like the themes it's a Listening, which I all found really compelling. I just wanted different and better execution. I saw somebody mention Ari Oster as a director for this and oh yeah, it would be a completely different ending, definitely more in line with the original story, but he would knock it out of the park. All of those moments that Shyamalan pulls away from, he would too, but then he'd bring you right back to linger on it so you can just bask in the horror. I guess I would maybe just recommend going into this expecting a little bit more comedy than just the full thriller tension that you might be expecting based on the trailers, but not so much that it ends up feeling like comedy. If you're a fan of The Happening for how it just juggles sentimentality with just really awkward dialogue and acting, you might end up really loving this, but I don't actually think it hits the full lengths of what The Happening did in those areas. I guess I was just hoping for more unsettling and less hokum or like so much hokum that it just became fun. I, I saw somebody use hokum as a way to describe M. Night Shyamalan and I was like, yes, I like it. But with M. Night, you never really know what you are getting. Like rather than letting us sit and stew in any of these horrific moments, the camera just always feels like it's moving. It's always doing these sweeps where you can hear something horrible happening in the background, but it's focusing on someone just walking away, then it pans back over. In some instances, that camera panning was used really well and it did increase the unease, but sometimes it just felt like it was pulling away from something I wanted to see. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't have wanted this to feel chaotic because I definitely do, but it's just like sometimes those moments where you can really focus in on horrific situations happening is what lets that dread build. And sometimes it's like he specifically asks people to act and deliver awkwardly written lines more awkwardly than they need to be. But it feels like it has to be intentional because I know these people can act. I know a lot of the dialogue in the comic feels awkward as well, but I think that probably has a little bit more to do with the fact that it was translated from French to English. But there's just so many moments that the way that somebody would be delivering a line would just pull me out of the movie. Rufus Sewell is like the real highlight in this though, in terms of the performance. Like he does definitely showed up for the assignment as weird as it was like some other people have some highlights but yeah basically I already think that Shyamalan had his return to form and that this just doesn't stick the landing but opinions about M. Night are so weird some people are saying this is his best movie since Signs other The Village some people hate Signs other people hate The Village some people love The Visit other people really hate it some people say that Split is his post Village highlight and that everything else has just been like a downward decline so it really is going to come down to personal opinion 
opinion, which I think is a beautiful thing. I will say that this will probably be a lot more fun to watch with a group, maybe at home, so you can all just kind of yell, what the fuck, at the screen when like the really weird things happen, so you can like build up the comedy aspects and then maybe like get the group tension going on, like if one person's scared, it, it might, I think it's just a better vibe. But I did catch for one glorious moment in time when Rotten Tomatoes had it perfectly balanced at 56 to 56 for both audience and critics. And I thought that was gonna start drifting where like the audience score would be higher, but like, no, like they both just kept going down. It's still early. I do think some people are really gonna like this and it's gonna bump up those, uh, those audience reviews a little bit more, but uh, I don't think I'm gonna be rating it fresh. But let's get into some more of the specifics with the story. Again, no real spoilers, but if you're someone who just doesn't wanna know anything outside the trailers, this is probably a good point to jump off. But we're just gonna talk about setup and some more specifics from the graphic novel. Now the comic book sets the story up very differently. In the movie, they go to a resort first and then end up on the beach. But with the graphic novel, we start with the people just arriving at this beach. And it's a place these people have been before. One kid literally has a height marker and everything to compare how tall he got since last year. So whatever's happening here is definitely new and it kind of just feels like a Twilight Zone episode where people are just dropped into this location and situation where time is just suddenly just not how it's supposed to work. And there's so many little threads in this that just don't seem to go anywhere. A few biblical mentions that tie into the parable vibe, a potential Jesus stand-in, and then some things that are abnormal that just aren't commented on again. Like this guy's random and spontaneous nosebleed that started before he got hit in the face and went on for hours before stopping. At first they can make calls out to people and then they're told that that's the wrong number and then the number just doesn't exist. Readers aren't offered any kind of explanation or answers, which is where Shyamalan pops up to provide them. Which I think people are really going to appreciate from a movie going standpoint, but it definitely changes the vibe of what the story seemed to have been going for. And I do think it's interesting how Shyamalan took some of those unanswered threads and found a way to work it into this larger story that he wanted to tell. I think he just kind of ends it off a bit too clean. Now one of the obvious themes here is mortality and how we deal with it or just avoid it. How fast life passes when you boil it down to those key moments of like birth, aging and death, how much time we spent wishing we were older when we were younger, and how much time we spent wishing we were younger when we're older. It all passes so quickly and it's easy to get caught up in things that just don't matter in the long run, then suddenly you're on your deathbed and you realize how much time you've wasted. So if you knew how much time you had left, how would you use it? Would you enjoy it, fight it, or ignore it? What if we spend this whole time trying to get out of here we still don't make it? It'll be too short if we don't try! And I feel that's about as deep as the movie gets with it, but because it's Shyamalan, something else is going on. So from the get-go, the resort is kind of sketch. It's called Animica, which literally means without a name, and the second they get to the resort, they're given these specialized drinks based on their food preferences. And we're also told that this is basically one last vacation before this couple gets separated and that the mother is dealing with some kind of benign tumor medical condition. And the kids just kind of feel weird sometimes too, like their six-year-old son Trent makes friends with the resort manager's nephew Idlib, and they both have a bit of a precocious vibe, like they make and decode ciphers together. They randomly walk around the beach asking people what their occupation and names are because that's what you want when you're on vacation. Trent also mentions that they can grow up together and be neighbors with mortgages. What six-year-old knows about a mortgage? But there's some weird stuff with Idlib. Like his uncle doesn't really want him hanging around these guests and he leaves Trent with another uh, message to decode. There's also a moment before they head to the beach where a woman has a seizure at breakfast that just kind of sets off some early unease and it also just seems like it's setting up to know that this guy's a doctor and this guy's a nurse. And it's the resort manager himself that recommends the beach, says it's very private and he only recommends it to the best special guests, which apparently also includes the asshole doctor. I can't show you that he's an asshole because there's no clips of them at the resort, but he's an asshole. And this is also where the M. Night cameo is. He can't help himself. Honestly, I'd probably put myself in movies too. So they get down to the beach and find that they're not alone. See, we got a little glimpse of the night before where this guy and young girl are on the beach and the girl goes skinny dipping. Either way, this dude is just on the background of the beach the entire time. It's pretty creepy and ominous. And the girl is just nowhere to be seen. And sadly, the ominous nature of this random person being on a beach, not moving or making any sound, just always in the background of a shot is completely completely undercut when Maddox shouts, Oh my God, it's mid-sized sedan! Because apparently that's a famous rapper. 
and M. Night Shyamalan decided to name him Mid-Sized Sedan. I kind of imagine it from this scene from Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh my god! It's Mid-Sized Sedan! It's f***ing hilarious, but what kind of story are you telling here, man? Like, I get that it's M. Night and he just does this, but anytime any kind of tension is building, he just pulls the rug out. But this is where the weirdness starts right out of the trailer. They find the belongings from people who had been on the beach before, rusty utensils from the resort. Later on, they find a journal from a science fiction author, which is a nice nod to the comic where one of the people on the beach is a science fiction writer. Trent notices that there's no fish in the water and then the dead body hits into him. Not long after the dog died, but I didn't even care because I didn't even really have time to register that there was a dog there, then the doctor's mother dies. And it's once they get the body out of the water that mid-sized sedan wanders over. Apparently he watched her swim super far out and then just stayed there overnight. Now in both the comic and the movie, the doctor accuses this particular character of killing the girl and trying to escape. Makes less sense in the movie because he's just chilling there. But about the movie and the comic, the doctor is fairly racist. In the comic, it is overtly so and a little bit more subtle in the movie. I've got nothing against this man. I'm just doing what needs to be done. Sure. So people are rightfully freaked out. They try calling the hotel, but they can't get through. And then a new couple shows up, the nurse and his wife with epilepsy. The newcomers start asking them how old they are and think they're being messed with because the kids have aged at least five years and don't realize it. You're 11, right, Trent? I'm six. They're feeling unsafe. There is a lot going on here. They're playing with us. Now I will say I really like this over the shoulder camera work where like the people that like you're over aren't moving at all and it just really makes you feel like an observer and it settles you as to what's happening to the people that you can't see. This is where we're gonna get into some more specific spoilers and the things that lead into letting you know what was gonna happen at the end. So if you don't want any of that, it's probably a good time to hop off. Just know that it's like a wacky Shyamalan movie that doesn't quite get wacky enough to have merit in that standpoint and then also is constantly pulling the rug out of the tension until you kind of get further into the end. But by now, if you were watching, you should have noticed a trend. The instant mom mentions at the resort that she has a calcium deficiency. The mom has a benign tumor and now there's this lady with severe epilepsy. Mid-sized sedan reveals that he was recently diagnosed with some kind of rare blood clotting disorder and that the reason why he connected with this girl is because she just found out she was diagnosed with MS. But I had already clocked the medical connection the second the dad, Guy, is looking at a brochure in their hotel room for a pharmaceutical company. Five minutes into the movie and specifically says that the medical insurance company he works for loves them. That on top of the hotel giving them specialized drinks the second they walked in, yeah. M. Night, you gave it away! I realize that a good twist gives you pieces so that when you get to the end, like it has a satisfying payoff that just didn't come out of nowhere. Which we did have, like the casual mention of a calcium deficiency, seizures and epilepsy are pretty common, but like a medical brochure in a hotel room? Come on. So clearly whatever's going on here has something to do with medical experimentation. And everyone else is just collateral. And in terms of the aging stuff, I feel like they make it fairly obvious that it's something the beach just naturally does, like driver M. Night will not not help them carry down these massive baskets of food that the hotel resort insisted they take down to the beach. It's also super clear that they're being watched. Trent sees some kind of reflecting light in the distance that never really goes away. Later on, we realize it's a camera. At one point, we are blatantly shown M. Night Shyamalan looking at them with binoculars and no one else seems to notice. And now they've aged up again. Thomas and Mackenzie can pull Huff 16 and 19, so they just let her chill. But Trent is now Alex Wolf. At this point, the corpses have rapidly decayed and they realize that they're all aging about one one year for every 30 minutes passed. And if that wasn't enough to freak them out, it seems like there is something very wrong with the doctor. He randomly slashes Sedan in the face and is just like, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were gonna attack me. My bad. Then when the mom's tumor spontaneously grows to the size of a cantaloupe in seconds, as he's about to perform the surgery, he gets completely distracted and asks about a movie that stars both Jack Nicholson and Marlon Brando. It's Missouri Breaks, by the way. But this is kind of how that scene played out. Do you know that Jack Nicholson did a film with Marlon Brando? Oh no. What's he saying? What was the name of that film? Are you okay? Yes, just let me do my job. Does anyone know the name of that film? It was with Jack Nicholson and Marlon Brando. Both. And I actually felt that that was ridiculous in a good way because it's just so like, what What do you mean? You're, you're about to cut open a woman. Why are you asking about Marlon Brando? So it seems like the doctor is suffering the effects of dementia. In the comic, they specifically mention Alzheimer's, whereas the wife in the movie definitely knows that something is going on with him. And that's the reason why they're on this vacation. I'm guessing the hospital told him that he wasn't allowed to perform surgeries anymore. But even the comic suggests that she might know that this was something he was dealing with. That's what I mean by it seems like Shyamalan took some little threads and then built them into something that like made sense in that context. And I think there was actually a 
hint earlier, which might account for why it was so awkward when the guy was like, my name is Jaren. Because immediately after Jaren tells him his name and Patricia's seizure stops, Charles the doctor calls him Jack. And in the moment, I thought it was because he was being an arrogant douche that didn't care about this guy's name. But when he gets corrected, he kind of gets this little look on his face that's like, oh, I really should have remembered that. I don't think he would have actually forgotten something that fast if he had like early stages of dementia. But M. Night isn't really about subtlety, but I do appreciate that this does still feel like a subtle hint of what's to come. Or maybe he's just a douche. Something's gonna happen at the end that kind of like derails this specific conversation in a certain way, but I still think it applies and I think it's better. So we're just gonna keep it mentioning it. But thankfully, Jaren being a nurse knows enough to help keep the doctor focused. But they literally have to hold and pull the incision open because it keeps trying to close instantly. Rapid aging means rapid healing. And now we have the pregnancy. What's happening? Mom! So this is what horrified me the most. Pregnancy already grosses me out and just thinking about a girl who was six, but like looked for and had to be carried down to a beach who now is physically 15, spontaneously getting pregnant is no. But it wasn't spontaneous at all. Her and Trent do it. Too late for tears now, bucko. Watch your damn super aging children, people. Oh my God. So even if they're not fully mentally progressing because they're not learning or experiencing new things, the brain is still developing and hormones are hormones. Anyways, this is somehow worse than spontaneous island pregnancy. But also just makes me feel more reassured that if I was on this island, I would not spontaneously get pregnant. I would just die really fast. So within minutes, Kara is in labor, but the second the baby is born, it dies. Because of how fast time passes, just leaving it unattended for less than a minute is enough for it to die from inattention. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. This doesn't happen in the comic book. We'll get to that. I actually think the comic book ending is more horrifying. So instead of being there for her daughter, Crystal, AKA Instamom, stumbles away. But it's where we get a line. This is probably the only one that made me audibly laugh out loud, genuinely, because I thought it was funny. Kara's mom, Crystal, can't handle things, so she starts talking to Maddox about the regrets of her past. When I was your age, I was in love with a man. His name was Giuseppe. It's just the hilarity of this woman whose six-year-old daughter just gave birth telling an 11-year-old about her first love, Giuseppe. And I probably find it more funny because I'm just immediately thinking of that Curtis Connor clip. Hey, it's fucking Giuseppe. I'm sure this isn't funny at all, and I'm so sorry if your name is Giuseppe. It's a dope name. But it's just the instant reaction I had. <laughs> this is essentially the wallowing and regret stage of life. But they finally piece together that they're specifically here because of those medical conditions. Prisha and the mom won a random sweepstakes on a pharmacy receipt, so the resort knows their medical conditions. This is where they also freak out about the fact that the resort has their passports so they can make it like they were never there. But you can never do that without a massive amount of government involvement. Even if you wipe their computers and all evidence of them traveling, like the flight records would still be there. So amidst the insanity of kids having a baby, the current theory is that the rocks on the beach are creating some kind of effect that makes their cells age rapidly. And trying to leave that field is like trying to come up from deep underwater too quickly. And that's why they're passing out. They're not giving their bodies time to acclimate and to do that would probably take about 20 years. While they're trying to figure out all that, everything falls apart, more so than it already had. The doctor stabs the shit out of mid-sized sedan and then seems to pull apart his mother's corpse. Again, it doesn't actually show, you just kind of hear like a squelching noise and he's playing with a bone. Jaren decides to see if it's possible to swim outside of the field and dies. Kara falls to her death after passing out trying to climb out. Patricia dies of a seizure. The mom starts losing her hearing and the dad's eyesight starts to go. Oh no. Then Crystal kind of snaps in a cave and then literally snaps in the cave. That calcium deficiency was actually pretty serious and now she's snapping like a demonic possession victim. And at one point tries to kill herself by dropping a rock on her head, but then it like hits her shoulder and then it heals in the wrong position while the kids are just looking at her horrified, clutching a match. It's disturbing, but hits a point where a lot of people are probably just gonna laugh because it's so uncomfortable to watch or just because they think it's funny. I fall in the former. And then Doc gets a knife again, like seriously, why is no one watching this man better? And he immediately tries to kill Guy. So the mom slashes him with one of those rusty knives that the kids found on the beach and has one of those, ha, rust acts like poison in the blood moments as he just rapidly dies horrifically. Which leaves us with the family we started with. And it essentially comes down to them realizing that things don't matter, but like in a good way. The tumor that made her fear her own mortality, her cheating, the mistakes they made. They're just happy to be together in the end. <laughs> Oh,
So this is where it feels like it ties in a little bit more to one of the stories that's told in the graphic novel. The nosebleed guy that became mid-sized sedan in the movie does not get stabbed to death and tells the story of Death's messenger and the king, who locked himself away from his wife, daughter, and son to prevent Death from finding him again after begging for more time, only to realize that he spent the last seven years of his life he was guaranteed not living at all. Which is kind of how a lot of people probably feel on their deathbed, sadly. And then they die, leaving the kids alone, who by morning are in their 50s. So they start making another sandcastle. And as I mentioned, the graphic novel's name is Sandcastle. And I think it's because the sandcastle can kind of reflect how fragile life is. In the grand scheme of the universe, your life really isn't anything more than a sandcastle that just gets swept out with the tide, and that's the fragility of life. Or maybe be a little bit more nihilistic, the things you've built, bought, or birthed while being just as fragile as you are eventually will withstand us all. In the graphic novel, everyone just starts passing away from old age, and it leads for some striking imagery. One couple wanders out into the water after the kids fall asleep, others lay down to never wake again. And then it cuts to day with bodies strewn around the beach, even the kids die overnight, leaving only the baby-minded adult that was born on the beach yesterday alone building a sandcastle. Dealing with loneliness and despair, avoiding what's coming like we all do, but no one avoids death. Woo, are we having fun yet? So the kids in the movie do the same thing, but it's more of like, yeah, we should probably try to find a way out of here, but like, do you wanna have fun building a sandcastle one more time? Taking the time to enjoy those little things. And as they're accepting their fate, Trent remembers that Idlib left him one last message to decode, and he's like, huh, guess I should probably do that, that's fun. But do you know what that sucker says? My uncle hates the coral. The coral that was mentioned for like two seconds when they hit the beach. Apparently if you swim through it, it insulates you from the effect of the island so you can escape to the other side. So this is where our philosophical look at the frailty of human life and mortality just gets thrown out the window. And we are in it with medical ethics. Which I knew had to be coming, but basically they found this beach where people age rapidly and decide to use it as a way to rapidly conduct drug tests before pushing them through to official testing. Why waste time waiting for a drug trial to fail when you can figure out if it's gonna work in a single day? That's why Patricia took so long to have a seizure, the medicine they gave her worked. But then something's brought up that bothered me. One of the scientists brings up that they should be isolating the mental health patients from the medical patients because their violent schizophrenic ruined their blood clotting trial. So the doctor did not have dementia, he had violent schizophrenia. We need to stop jumping for schizophrenia for this kind of stuff, especially where dementia is horrifying enough as it is and provides a plausible explanation, except maybe he goes a little bit too violent in the movie. But dementia causes confusion, disorientation can make you confused use different people with other people you've seen before, make you suspicious, cause you to lose focus when you're doing something and go on a completely different tangent. And it can result in people becoming more violent. I guess schizophrenia has been linked to memory loss and impairment, but I don't know, it just felt weird and a bit unnecessary. Like in the comic, the doctor was just an asshole that got Alzheimer's. I don't know why they couldn't just do that here too. But this introduced at the very last second an entirely new philosophical debate. Are the lives of the few worth the lives of many? And is it worth killing people that have no bearing on the study to get those results. And things are already murky here if you look at logistics. As mentioned, people would start asking questions if full families just completely disappeared after they mentioned they were going on vacation. But back to the movie, Observer Shyamalan thinks that they drowned. Obviously they didn't. And that journal that they found earlier has all the names and addresses of the people that the sci-fi writer was on the beach with. And because Trent played what's your name and occupation, he knows that this dude is a cop. So he gives them all the evidence, he checks that they're all missing people, and it's such a cleanly wrapped up Shyamalan movie and it happened so quickly. If this is the direction he wanted to go and I think he should have hard cut after Trent gave the cop the journal. Though I did have one last moment of impending doom where I thought the helicopter that was taking them to the airport was gonna crash because it seemed like it was getting way too close to the beach and the rocks. But it doesn't. It's a very happy ending for a Shyamalan movie that's supposed to be dealing with the futility of trying to avoid your own mortality. Because no one makes it off the island in the comic book. It sets up a couple things to suggest that there was an exit that they just didn't find. And I know there was apparently an ending that had more answers and solutions to the mystery, but the author and the artist both decided that it was futile to the purpose of the story they were telling. It's a fable.
table, not a thriller. But Shyamalan made it a thriller, which is totally fine. It's okay to take bare bones from something that you liked and try to build it into something bigger. I think there's a lot of good ideas here. I just don't know how I like the execution. I'm really stuck on Ari Aster's sandcastle, not old. But yeah, that is gonna do it for today's video. Uh, definitely not a strong outing for Shyamalan in my opinion, but lots of really interesting concepts brought up with this story. I think it's a really interesting premise. If you've seen old, let me know what you think down below. Otherwise, let me know what your favorite Shyamalan movies are. And do you think he had a return to form? Is this a decline? Is he still just kind of doing good? I feel like this is kind of mid-row for, for Shyamalan. It's nowhere near as worse and it's nowhere near as best. But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and special thanks to Izzy, who is my newest Jedi Knight patron. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.